The residents of East Palestine are feeling the results of a decades-long battle between corporate powers and a democratically elected government. One of the elected officials who has spent his career focused on that very struggle is Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders. This week, he is out with a new book, It's Okay to Be Angry About Capitalism, in which Senator Sanders details the struggle against corporate influence in government in both major political parties and outlines his vision to fix it. He writes, the ruling class get their lobbyists to work on assuring that when policies and regulations are written, Congress and the state legislatures will agree to those that consolidate their advantages. By the time the average American catches on, the rules have already been rigged so that the rich get richer and everyone else gets left behind. When the oligarchs and the corporate world are waging class war against working class Americans, the working class needs a party that will fight back and win. Joining us now is Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders. Senator, thank you so much for joining me. Congrats on the book. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry that we still have to be writing about some of the same problems that have been entrenched, it seems, in American society for quite some time. I want to talk to you about just, you know, before we get to the substance of the book, although this has to do very much with that, what's happening in Ohio, right? It seems like it's the nexus of three problems that you detail in the book. The first is corporate lobbying, the strength of it in terms of shaping federal policy workers' rights, which are consistently subsumed in the name of corporate profit, and health care for the most vulnerable communities in this, in this state, in this country. What should Democrats be doing at this moment as national news coverage is focused on this issue that dovetails with so many of the fundamental problems in American society? Well, it's interesting that this terrible derailment and accident took place just at the moment that some of us have been taking on the rail industry, mm -hmm. as you indicated, record-breaking profits. What we should add to what you said is that in the last six years, based on what Wall Street wanted to increase profits, they have downsized their workforce by 30 percent in six years. Yeah. So you talk to the workers and say, we're asked to do more work with fewer people, and that causes safety concerns. That's what the workers have told us. And then on top of all of that, these rail executives who make zillions of dollars a year couldn't find it in their hearts to provide one day of paid sick, sick leave please. for their workers. And I think we have had some impact. The railroads are beginning to do that as a result of public pressure. But as you indicated, this is just another example of incredible Wall Street corporate power at the expense of workers, at the expense of a community mm -hmm. in Ohio now and uh, the general community. I mean, the governor of Pennsylvania looks like he's looking at criminal indictments for this. I mean, what, what, is, the, what is the punitive measure that should be sought out at this we point? We have allowed these guys, and, and corporate America in general, that's what this whole book is about, to get away with murder. Mm -hmm. Year after, and it's not just the railroads. It's the pharmaceutical industry that charges us the highest prices in the world. They raise their prices, and you know what? People die. And they could do anything they want. And the government, well, they have 1,700 paid lobbyists, pharmaceutical industry, in Washington, D.C. It's health care. Yeah. You tell me, Alex, how in the richest country on earth, we're the only major country not to guarantee health care to all people. But good news, insurance companies make billions of dollars a year in profit. Yeah. All right. So what this whole book is about is taking a hard look at, it's not just the rail industry, it's what's going on in America. And the bottom line is, Middle class continues to shrink. We have more income and wealth inequality in America today than we have ever had. Yeah. And we've got to address those issues. You, you know, you write at the beginning of the book that it's considered by some to, to, to question the American power structure, to question the way the country is run is un-American. And it harkens so much back to the 1960s when there was this notion of, like, anybody who asked tough questions of those in power, who challenged the status quo, oh, well, you're a flaming, like, you're a flaming liberal. You can't be taken seriously. The true patriots, the true Americans abide the law. Law, they wear the tie and they go about their day they don't questioning. They abide like, the law. They make the law. They make the law. And you can't have any criminal problems with these guys because they have made the, the law. The law, exactly. And they refuse to, to ask questions about systemic injustices, whether they're economic, racial, what have you, right. is somehow um, is, is anti-American. And it feels like we're back we're back having the same dis debate well, that we've had that we had in the civil rights well, era. I'll tell you something. As somebody who has had the opportunity to go all over this country, mm -hmm. what makes me feel confident, I have been there. 
I've been to Iowa, and I've been to California, and I've been all over the state of Vermont. And you know what? Ordinary people do not agree with the ruling class of this country that the status quo is acceptable. Yeah. Go out and ask them whether they think the ruling class is protecting their interests, and people say, no, we want real change. Now, the problem is, how do you take on this big money? How do you take it on politically when billionaires can buy elections, right? Mm -hmm. You want to run for office? Guy can put $100 million into the super PAC supporting you or opposing you. Is that democracy? I don't think so. We have more concentration of ownership in this country, right? In sector after sector, whether it's Wall Street, transportation, whether it's, you know, pharmaceutical industry, a handful of large corporations, it's media. Yeah, yeah. Do we talk about corporate ownership of media much? Well, listen, I stand by what we put on the air here, you know, and we ask tough questions, but I, I, I want to, I would ask you in return, I know you have embraced social media as a way, you, you, you write about it in the book yeah. as a way that you got your campaign message across. Right. And I would say, do you, do you take issue with Facebook? Do you take issue with Twitter? I mean, no. their owners are not exactly You're free from no. criticism. You're absolutely at, right. And that's a discussion we have to have. From our perspective, we utilize what we could. Yeah. All right. But I think as a nation... You know, you're not going to be a vibrant democracy unless you have a vibrant media. And my view on media is not, it's not Donald Trump's the people and fake news. I don't believe that for a second. You got serious reporters trying to do their job. Yeah. But I think if you ask people, are we really discussing the structural crises facing America? Why do we not have health care for all? What about three people owning more wealth than the bottom half of American society? And questions like that. We really don't have that kind of discussion. And look, I, I think that there is a limitation on what is discussed broadly in media, right? And that has to do with a lot of different factors, not just ownership, but also the way, the, stru the sort of structure of how media is funded. Right. Right. But I also think, you know, people have gotten disenchanted with yes, government, they have. right? And, and, and you, in your book, you know, there is a note, there are continuous notes of optimism, but there's also, you know, the word angry is in red on the cover. Huh. And I ask you, how do you calibrate the, 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 you know, the sort of tonal dissonance between being at once really hopeful about the possibilities and really angry about the realities? I mean, how do you convince people not just to be angry, but to also be hopeful that things can change? That is a great question. I wish I could give you <laughs> a brilliant answer to it. I can't. That's a good question. Look, I can say two things that ordinary people by the millions, and this is one of the reasons why Trump became president. They don't believe what goes on in Washington anymore. They see people, we talk and we talk, and they say, you know what? I can't afford health care. I can't afford to send my kids to college. I don't have any paid family and medical leave. Cost of housing is going up. My schools are in Africa. You keep talking. What are you doing? Yeah. Why should I believe in democracy? when life expectancy in my community is actually going down while billionaires become richer. You guys talk, you don't do a damn thing. Mm -hmm. And then Donald Trump comes along, yeah. okay? So to my mind, what if we are really serious, and I know you know you, talk, you just talked about it five minutes ago, if we're serious about preserving American democracy, government has to deliver for people. Mm -hmm. And in order for government to deliver for working people, you know what? You gotta have the guts to take on the ruling class of this country which today has enormous economic power, political power, and media power. And you got to do that. And the Democratic Party has got to say, you know what, workers, we're standing with you. Okay, we are going to guarantee you health care. We're taking on the drug companies. You are going to be able to send your kids to college tuition free. You know what? We're not going to have a, a child care system in disarray. And you know what? If you're pregnant, you have a baby, you're going to have eight or nine months paid leave so you can take care of your baby. Can I have those months retroactively? Yeah, <laughs> I have two of them. But they exist in Scandinavia. Yes. All right. This is not radical utopian idea. Yeah. So we got to bring our people together, black and white and Latino, to stand up for justice and have the courage to take on big money interests. Senator Sanders, you know, you are an inspiration to people who very much care about these issues and understand their importance. You are all business all the time, <laughs> which is one of the most lovely, charming, um, impenetrable things about you. I don't know if you know that your seriousness has been captured on TikTok. I think it's from today. Do we have the video? Can we just show it to the viewing public? You're walking. There's some TikToker walking down the street, and there you are in the background, totally annoyed. It's like perfection.
Yeah, that looks like you just got places to go. You yep. don't have time for a TikTok video, and yet you're the best part of it. Um, Senator, thank you for your time. Congratulations thank on you. keeping us awake and doing the work. Thank you for the great job you've done. Thank you, and good luck.